Okay, so this Zoom is because I forgot to record in the Zoom earlier uh, when it would have been really useful. So <laughs> I'm going to go to share screen and we're just going to go to the short story for this week by Neil Gaiman called How to Talk to Girls at Parties. And this is gonna be just a quick lesson as I point out a few of the things that um, stood out to me as both a reader and a writer that gave me a reason, that suggested to me that, hey, I wanna teach this story. Um, it was nominated for a Hugo Award in 2007, and I'll point out why I think that was. Uh, so Neil Gaiman is one of the most famous urban fantasy uh, speculative fiction author is currently writing books. Uh, he wrote the novel American Gods, which they've made uh, into a series on one of the channels. I don't remember which one. Um, and he's famous for the Coraline series as well. So you may already know his name. So we end up with, we start off with two characters. We have Vic and N, although we don't get N's name until much later. Um, and we will eventually learn that this story is told from N's point of view, but it is a point of view. Uh, he, he's 30 years older, looking back at a time when he was a teenager going to an all boys school. And so uh, if we were looking at this from a literary perspective, um, we would consider how that point of view informs us of something that the character at the time did not understand. Um, and the thing that the character at the time didn't understand is that uh, the girls at the party they're going to are in fact aliens. Um, and looking at it from a writer's perspective, uh, there are things that Neil Gaiman does that make the story work, right? because the story has a couple of inherent problems to, to pull off uh, and not understanding what's going on. Uh, he, Gaiman has to show the reader that the girls are aliens, but also have it be believable uh, that N just wouldn't get it at the time. Um, and then he also has to let us know whether or not uh, the N narrator who is telling us the story 30 years later uh, does understand what happened. And so I'm just going to point out a few things that work really well with this story um, in case you were wondering about it. Um, we didn't get very many questions in today's Zooms. Uh, the first one was delayed because my internet was actually down. Uh, so if you do have questions, you can always email me um, or stop by tomorrow Zoom from the 11 to 12 o'clock hour where I'll just be here to answer questions. Um, okay, so one of the reasons why this story works is because N, our main character, goes to an all boys school, right? And his experience with young women consists of having kissed three of his sister's friends. Uh, and so, one of the things that's going to become clear throughout the course of the story is that to N, girls are alien in terms of they're unfamiliar. They are um, like a whole other species because he doesn't understand them because he goes to an all boys school. Um, so one of the things that uh, the author does, which is different from the narrator, right? Uh, one of the things the author does is he will give us a whole lot of space descriptors and metaphors before we ever get to the party. Um, and that helps get us ready uh, for the aliens as readers. And it also gives us some information about maybe what the narrator thinks 30 years later, looking back when presumably uh, the narrator has a little bit more experience with women. Uh, if you don't know what snogging means, if you're unfamiliar with British slang, it sounds much worse than it, in, than it is. Uh, it just means making out, like kissing. It doesn't mean anything, you know, more graphic than that. 
Um, and then we have a little bit of foreshadowing here with politics or poetry. Okay, and then we're gonna get to uh, Vic tells and he's gonna talk to them. <clears throat> Uh, and somewhere in here, he was like, he explicitly says, you know, they're girls, not aliens, uh, which is ha ha ha, uh, a little bit of foreshadowing, uh, but also begins building in this, this idea for the reader, um, because they never actually come out and say anywhere in the book or anywhere in the short story that the girls are actually aliens. Um, let's see. So then we have some of the space descriptors. So here's one example, you know, had drifted into my orbit. Um, and there should be another one up here. Oh yeah, uh, in front of the news agents, which smelled of alien spices, okay. Uh, oh, and here is where Vic says, they're just girls, they don't come from another planet. Okay, all right, then they finally get to the party and uh, the hostess of the party is a young woman named, dun, dun, dun. her name is Stella, uh, which means star, uh, which is not a coincidence at all. Uh, and then there's this whole other thing with, whoop, we have this paragraph where we get a bunch of band names mentioned um, and we have uh, some punk with the Stranglers, the Clash, and the Sex Pistol, Sex Pistols. Um, and then you get some uh, kind of what becomes New Wave uh, with ELO and Roxy Music and, uh, you know, Bowie. I guess that's more glam at that point. It's not New Wave yet. It would be glam. Um, and then you get that contrast of Neil Young's Harvest uh, and his song Heart of Gold, which uh, is, you know, Neil Young is known for being a poet. Um, certainly punk is a different type of poetry, uh, but later on, Neil Gaiman's narrator is gonna launch into this idea that poetry colonizes your mind. And if you think about how your favorite songs and your favorite music uh, colors, how you see the world and how their lyrics live in your mind and you find yourself uh, dreaming in song or humming songs in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day, even if you haven't heard them for a while, and how much later you can hear a song and it will put you back in a moment in time. Um, what's going to be said later will make a lot of sense. Um, so, and of course, songs are poems set to music. Okay, uh, so here we are at this party and the music playing in the front room isn't anything and recognizes. It sounds like a bunch of things, but it's different. And then we have Stella and she's shining like a star. He doesn't say like a star. We can infer it because she's shining. Uh, and then, so Vic goes off with Stella, and we follow N into his, through his encounters with three young women. Uh, the first one, he says, what's your name? And she's like, I'm Wayne's Wayne, I'm a second. And she says very strange things. Uh, she has, one of her fingers has split into two smaller fingertips. And she says she's a second while her more perfect sisters remain in stasis back home. Uh, and N, because remember, he has, he goes to an all boys school. He has no experience with women. He's like, oh yeah, okay. And he just accepts everything she says. And he's like, you know, I don't even live in Croydon. So I totally understand. <laughs> he has no idea what she's talking about, but he doesn't actually expect to, which is one of the reasons why the story works. Uh, and then she says some really strange things about uh, how she feels about travel on a street in Rio at Carnival, 
I saw them on a bridge, golden and tall, insect-eyed and winged and elated. I almost ran to greet them before I saw that they were only people in costumes. Uh, I said to Holt the Colt, why do they try so hard to look like us? And Holt the Colt replied, because they hate themselves, all shades of pink and brown and so small. Uh, it is what I experienced, even me, and I am not grown. It is like a world of children or of elves. Then she smiled and said, it's a good thing they could not any of them see holocults. And to this really strange uh, bit of information, N replies, ah, do you want to dance? And she's like, oh no, I can't do that. I might fall. <laughs> or, you know, I can't do anything that might cause damage uh, to myself because I am property. Uh, so he wanders off to get her a drink of water, comes back, she's gone. Uh, his next conversation. Uh, is with, what was her name? Let's see. She has, maybe we don't even get her name. Maybe she's just Gap Tooth Girl. Uh, and she's talking about how Jess spun webs between galaxies and her parent teacher uh, is unimpressed with her plans, which, you know, again, is believable because even though she's an alien, her problems right. are very so similar to those of uh, many teenage people. Uh, and same thing with Wayne's Wayne. She feels less perfect than other people, and so she feels like her options are limited. Um, and then that conversation ends, and N goes in and begins talking to Trialet. And Trialet says uh, that her name is a verse form, and so is she. And N manages to say, you're a poem. And she smiled and looked down, and she was like, well, yeah, you know, kind of. If you want, I am a poem, or I am a pattern, or a race of people whose world was swallowed by the sea. Well, gee, those three things are not quite parallel, right? So, a poem, okay. There's a relationship between poems and patterns. I can see that because they both have kind of, they rely on rhythm. But a race of people whose world was swallowed by the sea, that's a bit more of a jump. And N says, isn't it hard to be three things at the same time? And she says, you are male and you are a uh, biped and you are N. Is it hard to be three things at the same time? And he's like, those aren't contradictory. Excuse me. Um, and N, while, she, while he's looking at Triolette, he's not really thinking about what Triolette is. He's thinking about her thin dress made of white silky fabric and her eyes are a pale green. And this pale green keeps coming back, this color keeps coming back um, over the next few paragraphs. Um, and uh, he's thinking about what maybe Vic might be doing up in one of the bedrooms with Stella. So still, I was talking to this girl, even if we were talking nonsense, even if her name wasn't really Triolette. My generation had not been given hippie names. All of the rainbows and the sunshines and the moons, they were only six, seven, eight years old back then. Notice how um, there's a cadence there in those few sentences. Uh, what, Gert, uh, what Neil Gaiman is doing is he's leading us into this very poetic bit uh, from the poem, Triolette. Uh, were you to break these lines at each of these commas, right, and then before this parentheses, and then at this colon, and then at this comma, you would see that they, it almost forms a sonnet because they have almost the same number of syllables between each, uh, between each pause, and that creates kind of a sing-song rhythmic um, wave pattern that is very relaxing, right? Still, I was talking to this girl, 
even when we were talking nonsense, even if her name wasn't really Triolette. My generation had not been given hippie names. All the rainbows and the sunshines and the moons, they were only six, seven, eight years old back then. And then listen to the difference in how Triolette speaks. She said, we knew that it would soon be over. And so we put it all into a poem to tell the universe who we were and why we were here and what we said and did and thought and dreamed and yearned for. We wrapped our dreams and words and pattern the words so that they would live forever, unforgettable. Then we set the poem as a pattern of flux to wait in the heart of a star, leaving out its message and pulses and bursts and buzzes across the electromagnetic spectrum until the time when, on worlds a thousand sun systems distant, the pattern would be decoded and read, and it would become a poem once again. Okay, so there's much, there's a lot more syllables between your causes, right? Um, and also she's using a lot of those longer vowel sounds to stretch things out. We knew that it would soon be over and we put it into a poem to tell the universe who we were and why we were here and what we said and did and thought and dreamed and yearned for, right? So all of those kind of stretch things out and they slow down the cadence, right? And so instead of the dun 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 dun, dun it goes dun 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 Right, all right, and then what happened? Uh, and then she gets into this bit with her pale green eyes and and he's and notice he's talking about how she has her own Antigone half mask. Uh, and we get mask and eyes twice, right? So he's like staring, he's getting mesmerized by her. And now she says a bunch of things that are true about alien poems, apparently, and also poetry and music uh, in general, okay? Um, especially the first couple of sentences here. You cannot hear a poem without it changing you, she told me. They heard it and it colonized them. It inherited them and it inhabited them, its rhythms becoming a part of the way they thought, its images permanently transmuting their metaphors, its verses, its outlook, its aspirations becoming their lives. Within a generation, their children would be born already knowing the poem, and sooner rather than later, as these things go, there were no more children born. There was no need for them, not any longer. There was only a poem which took flesh and walked and spread itself across the vastness of the known. Well, first thing, uh, Anne should be really worried at this point, right? Because uh, she has said she's a poem and uh, she's telling about a poem that took on flesh and just went and colonized the universe and just took everything over. And he's like, da, 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 da. Oh my goodness, her leg is close to mine. Uh, but in the context of, of what music and poetry do, right? Uh, when we hear a song, some, there are songs that we hear that like colonize us and live forever in us. And, and there are poems that change us um, and change the way we look at the world. Um, and so this is true no matter what, which is one of the reasons why this story works. Um, and, and then of course, he's really concentrating on the fact that, ooh, she likes that I'm pressing my leg against hers. And, I, and she, uh, so she put her hand on my arm. Uh, and then she says, there are places that we are welcome and places where we are regarded as a noxious weed or as a disease, something to be immediately quarantined and eliminated. Uh, but where does contagion and an art begin? Uh, this is another idea, right? Like art is a way to spread dreams and beliefs and ideas um, in really beautiful ways. Uh, but what she's talking about is something a little bit different. Uh, but this idea of where does contagion and an art begin, like that is a fun question to play with. Uh, Although it 
takes on a little bit of extra weight right now for us. Uh, but it's something that, again, within the context of the story, we're and actually thinking about what's happening, uh, he should be way more worried than he is. Uh, and it, but no, he's like, I don't know, right? Uh, and he hears some unfamiliar music, and then she starts whispering something in his ear, and he says it's the strangest thing about poetry. You can tell it's poetry even if you don't speak the language. You can hear Homer's Greek without understanding a word, and you still know it's poetry. I've heard Polish poetry and Inuit poetry, and I knew that it was what it was without knowing her whisper was like that. I didn't know the language, but her words washed through me perfect, and in my mind's eye, I saw towers of glass and diamond, and people with eyes of the palest green, and unstoppable beneath every syllable, I could feel the relentless advance of the ocean. Right, and then, oh, I think I kissed her, right, because he's totally with it, has his priorities utterly straight, and the next thing you know, uh, Vic was shaking him violently, come on, let's go. Uh, if I had written this story, I would probably have ended it in a different place, right? So Vic's dragging N out of the party. And as he's dragging N out, N looks up and he sees Stella looking down at, from the top of the stairs. And he sees her face. And then this next paragraph is the narrator intruding on the story, right? Before he gives us what he sees on Stella's face, the narrator intrudes. Enough to say, this all happened 30 years ago. I've forgotten much. I will forget more. In the end, I will forget everything. Yet if I have any certainty of life beyond death, it is all wrapped up in not psalms or hymns, but in this one thing alone, I cannot believe that I will ever forget that moment or forget the expression on Stella's face as she watched Vic purring away from her. Even in death, I shall remember that. His clothes were in disarray and there was makeup smudged across her face and her eyes. You wouldn't want to make a universe angry. I bet an angry universe would look at you with eyes like that. I would end the story there. I would just end it, right? Um, but it goes on to be about, you know, the kind of, like, Vic understands what's going on and still does not, uh, but he's, his feet are treading out the measure of a poem that he could not properly remember and would never be able to repeat, right? But apparently affected him because here he is writing stories all this time later. Uh, so kind of noticing the, the way music and uh, descriptors for things related to space work through here and then also looking at how uh, and not realizing uh, the young women are aliens is realistic because and know so little about young women uh, that anything is possible and how that is realistic about um, sometimes interactions uh, between people especially uh, when they are young and their hormones take up most of their brains space it seems like so this was a fun little story uh, if you have additional questions or things that you're wondering about, please feel free to email me or stop by tomorrow's Zoom. Um, and yeah. <laughs>